Hello everyone um, and welcome to our first In Focus BU webinar, Diversity Matters for Mental Health. My name is Marie Kirkwood and I am a State Manager um, for the BU Initiative with Early Childhood Australia and joining um, me today is Vicky Rosas, who is a BU Consultant with Early Childhood Australia. BU is a single integrated initiative um, to promote mental health and wellbeing from in the early years from the early years to 18 years. It's for every Australian educator, from early learning services through to secondary schools, including future educators. It is led by Beyond Blue in partnership with Early Childhood Australia and Headspace, and is funded by the Australian government. BU also has a collaborative learning community for educators who are supporting the mental health and wellbeing of children and young people. Being part of this community means that your early learning service or school has access to be a BU consultant to assist you in undertaking your learning in action. So is your school or service registered and participating with BU currently? If you aren't registered, if your service or school isn't registered, you can do that today. Um, and then make sure that you, um, if you are already registered, um, be sure to mention the webinar next time that you've participated in this webinar next time you check in with your consultant. And if you aren't sure, please just send us a message via Facebook or on our website and we can get back to you. Now let me begin. Now let's begin exploring ways we can support everyone in our early learning service communities, uh, their mental health and wellbeing by considering how we embrace, embed and include diversity in our practice. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians from all the lands from which we are able to gather on today. And not, not to only acknowledge, but also pay my respect to elders past, present and future, and all those who continue to hold the memories, traditions and ways of being for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We recognise the importance of continued connection to culture, con country and community, to the health, social and emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Today, as we meet in this place, I also encourage you to think about reconciliation as a personal and as a professional practice and by looking at organisational reconciliation action plans. I encourage you to consider how we can all communicate, maintain relationships <laughs> and connectedness and how an awareness of this can influence children's and families' well-being how we respectfully communicate with everyone in our learning community on a daily basis and support practical reconciliation and build positive futures for all children and adults. Throughout today's webinar, I invite you to consider ways that relationships at your place are informed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives. Today, today um, we, will, we are all here today to consider, learn and reflect about early childhood well-being and education. A, a sense of safety um, is most most foundational requirement for positive mental health. Sense of security and performing relationships. On our screen are the BU ways for today. Remember, looking after yourself is very important. That sense of safety is what we mean by that is that people are safe to be who they are, are able to work towards their strengths, express their opinions and beliefs, and feel heard and respected even when there are opposing views. Children learn from what adults around them do. Being aware of how to look after ourselves and support each other can make a huge difference to each of us, the well-being of our team and to the children we work with. Children build a picture of who they are um, by observing the adults and modelling what they do. 
We'll be asking you to interact and contribute during the webinar today. There will be opportunity for you to, re to reflect on your own practices through polls and reflective questions. Contribute only what you feel comfortable with and when you feel okay about it. Um, you can join in via the, the chat box and we'll be posting links to resources here for you to copy um, if you're interested. So please remember to take care of yourselves today as we talk about mental health and have a plan for what will you, you will do if an unexpected or difficult feelings might occur. So sometimes unexpected feelings can emerge and even, and even difficult ones. So please be aware of these um, that have come up for you and make sure that you talk to somebody um, if this does happen. Um, the start might also be um, to talk to someone who can listen to help, a friendly, um, a friend, a family member, colleague, a health professional, or a crisis line like health uh, lifeline, and their phone number is 131114. Today we will be celebrating diversity. We will be mindful of the many ways diversity is reflected within our early learning community. We will be reflecting about what we can achieve by being aware of both the individual and collective identities within our community. We will be exploring the diversity represented in our early learning services and schools that we can support and increase our understanding of to promote inclusion and consequently positive mental health and well-being. We will be discussing how educators can create inclusive learning environments that provide every child with the opportunity to be who they are and to achieve their best mental health. And we will be considering our responses to diversity in learning environments and how it influences our capacity to protect children's rights, to encourage their agency and to provide space to build resilience. Uh, our vision, BU's vision, is that every learning community is positive, is inclusive and resilient. A place where every child, young person, educator and family can achieve their best possible mental health through promotion, prevention and early intervention. Prioritising our practices for inclusion and diversity influences our capacity to achieve this vision. Understanding and responding to diversity can be complicated at times, <laughs> but we all know that diversity and how we embrace embedded inclusive matters. It matters for determining how children, families and educators feel they belong and ultimately maintain positive mental health and well-being. This is because feelings of belonging, connectedness are central to our social, emotional well-being, to our behaviour, our learning and our relationships. So let's move on now to explore diversity and inclusion in more depth. So first, let's have a look at what we actually mean by diversity. Diversity is about difference. Uh, from, the, um, from the Collins Dictionary, it's defined that diversity of something is the fact that it contains many very different elements. So Australia's population is considered to be diverse, um, with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and migrants from almost every corner of the globe. Our learning communities will likely be culturally diverse with representatives from all or some of these groups. However, today we're not only talking about cultural diversity, which uh, refers to people who identify with particular groups based on their birthplace, ethnicity, language, values, beliefs or worldview. Uh, differences can also include age, religion, gender and gender identity, socioeconomic status, sexuality, education and literacy, family arrangements and circumstances, uh, personality, interests and abilities, ways of thinking, values, mental health, status, impairments and disabilities and physical attributes. It is also important to always remember that as well as the diversity existing between groups, there is always diversity within a group. Even when we identify as, we identify as being from a group, we have characteristics that set us apart from each other. Sometimes we can even identify or be identified as belonging to multiple groups.
we're going to have a little yarn now um, about how well we know our identity. Who we are, who we identify with, where we belong. So join us in the chat. How well do you know your own identity or identities? Where, who are you? What do you identify with? Where do you belong? When we were preparing this webinar, we were discussing about whether we consist of one identity that's shared out into multiple identities with, within the various contexts that we have, or if we have multiple identities that encompass up into one core identity. And we didn't really have an answer for that. It was just something that we were exploring. So what do you think? How well do you know your identity? Who are you? What do you identify with? Where do you belong? So you can consider this in terms of place, your role, your connections, and what might be important to you socially and culturally. Um, sometimes our identity could, can feel less visible as coming from a dominant culture perspective. So this leads us to think about stigma and privilege. The stigma can get in the way of inclusion and cast a negative light on diversity. Stigma, as de defined by the word health organi organization, is a mark of shame, disgrace, or disapproval, which results in an individual being rejected, discriminated against, and excluded from participating in a number of different areas of society. The stigma that exists between groups of people is a result of either actual or perceived difference between them. It can be from uh, it, can, it can be any form of difference, including personal, personal circumstances, gender, race, religious belief, sexuality, or mental health status, or it could be something else. We learn to notice differences from a very young age. Stigma is connected to and grows from stereotypes that are created by people for a variety of purposes, sometimes simply from a lack of understanding. When there is stigma, a negative social identity of a particular group is formed and assumptions are made that all people within that group share the same specific characteristics. Social exclusion can occur because of the negative attitudes held, um, held against some groups. So this is a, called negative stereotyping. So those that might have a physical impairment, um, those that might be experiencing a mental health difficulty, or perhaps someone um, who has a family member in prison. So self-stigma is often linked to poor self-esteem and in some, some sh and, and sometimes shame about that situation um, that, that can occur when people or family members um, who have been discriminated against. They can withdraw uh, or identify and define themselves by the characteristics of the stigma. Essentially, the stigma become, can become their identity, and this increases the potential for mental health issues. The, the discrimination people experience because of stigma also in, can also intensify the experience of feeling excluded or being different from others. The Human Rights Commission defines discrimination as the behavior that happens when a person or a group of people is treated less favorably than others because of their background or certain personal characteristics. This is known as direct discrimination. Discrimination may be obvious and deliberate or may be more subtle and unintended. Either way, it's unfair and potentially damaging. The Conventions on the Rights of the Child state that children should not be discriminated against for their individual differences. We should also not be discriminating in these ways with colleagues and with families that we engage in, in our learning communities. So what can we do? We can play a key role in calling out the stigma and discrimination experienced by children, young people and their families. The BU initiative encourages you to challenge discriminatory behaviour so that it is no longer ignored, ex expected or accepted. So privilege can make it more difficult to see how diversity, if not embraced, embedded and included, can negatively influence feelings and experiences of belonging, how it can create barriers and lead to discrimination. So privilege is an, is an unearned benefit 
It's an opportunity or an advantage given to someone because of their identity. When we talk about privilege, we're talking about people, we're asking people to think critically about power and about the way it can sometimes be held by certain people because of one or more facets of their identity. Things like race, religion, gender, sexuality, class, wealth, or ability. For those with privilege, it can also be embedded into our reality, but it, and that, that it can easily go un, unacknowledged or even unidentified. In essence, privilege is characteristically invisible to those people that have it. It is important to recognize that privilege itself is not a bad thing. It is useful instead to see it as an opportunity to foster empathy through using the power that comes from privilege um, in, correct, in correcting some of those inequities that already exist in our society. So when people experience the effects of stigma and discrimination, it is always important to acknowledge and draw on the protective factors in their lives for support. This could be internal strength and ability, interests, support networks, and positive relationships. So how we see the world is influenced by many things, by our identity and the potential stigma and discrimination or privilege attached to it. We each have very different experiences um, in the same environment or situations um, and many factors including diversity, identity and inclusion influence this. This is a very complex subject. This might bring up difficult feelings and thoughts so uh, let's check in with ourselves for a moment. When faced with challenges related to stigma and discrimination, people will answer the following questions differently to someone who isn't. Before we consider these questions, we need to remember the earlier discussions about safety, confidentiality, and participating in ways best for our well-being and self-care. Now let's consider the potentially different responses if someone, a child or an adult, either encounters stigma or discrimination or experience this privilege. From your point of view, if you think about someone from um, a low socioeconomic background who served a prison sentence and was released into community, how do you think this person would respond, feel and think about these questions? There is a barbecue, for example, this weekend with people I don't know very well. Am I happy to attend? Will I be greeted warmly when I arrive? And will anyone notice if I don't? Well, let's think about from a child's perspective, a child with a physical impairment, a child who is a wheelchair user. How would the child respond to these questions? Will I have someone to play with or be with me? Will someone talk to me during breaks? With some of these questions, keep in mind and consider what potential protective factors could exist in these people's lives. It is now important to step out of the space of considering these questions from multiple perspectives. Let's look at further at what we can do by considering diversity and identity from individual and collective perspectives. So far we have discussed that our individual identities are informed by characteristics that distinguish our uniqueness or our sameness. And there are certainly benefits to having our individu individuality and sameness visible and both contribute to our understanding of the world and where we fit in within it. We have discussed that through a community lens, diversity and identity inform each other and are central to feelings of belonging. A feeling of belonging is a protective factor for mental health that influences our capacity to form relationships, to feel safe, to explore, to learn and develop. We have discussed that taking time to consider our own identity is fundamental before we can appreciate the diverse identities within, within our communities. We discussed that how diversity and identity that exist occurs at both individual and community levels and influences mental health. Early learning services and schools who are open to learning about diversity within their learning communities provide 
many opportunities for all children and adults to be included. Have you looked closely at your learning community lately? Let's do a poll. Thinking about the many types of diversity, what we have considered so far, how informed do you think you are about the diversity that exists within your learning community? So I can see that many of you think they're very confident. Some people thinking about maybe. And I think this is a really um, considerate response to think about invisible diversity in this space as well. When we are well informed of the diversity within our community, we still won't always know the answers, the backgrounds or experiences that make up a child or a family's identity, and nor should we. It's really their choice and right within the boundaries of legal and duty of care requirements to choose how and when to share their circumstances or situation. Families sometimes keep information private for a variety of reasons because they are worried about being judged, the stigma attached to their situation, facing prejudice or being discriminated against. Also, some families may not identify with any group and may not wish to, and this is okay. They can still be part of an inclusive learning environment. How we understand, respond, and acknowledge their diversity so they are part of our inclusive learning community will be through our practices, which we promote awareness that everyone is different, everyone is valued, and has unique family circumstances and situations. Acknowledging and understanding the diversity that exists in learning communities and understanding the differences in individual and collective identities will assist in that inclusion in our everyday practice. And we need to be thinking about both explicit and implicit messages. The different backgrounds of the children and, and staff enrich the services character and identity. Early childhood services that are responsive to individual differences and respect diversity, promote kindness, respect, compassion, will benefit everyone and help to build an inclusive environment. So let's go to the next slide. So we come back to the question, how do we understand, respond and acknowledge all diversity so everyone is part of our inclusive learning community? Let's explore this further and then uh, look at how we can support individual differences in our learning services and schools and how we can support the rights of every child, whether their individual situation and circumstances fully known to us or not. Inclusion. An early learning service or school that celebrates diversity of children, families and educators welcomes diversity and understands the value of inclusion. Diversity needs to be actioned by inclusive practice, as diversity without inclusion doesn't make sense. Diversity for the sake of diversity. Inclusion is important and a protective factor for children's mental health and well-being. Children who experience exclusion are at risk of poor mental health and low self-esteem. Creating an inclusive environment is also important for nurturing children's developing identities. Inclusion helps children develop a sense of pride in who they are, which helps build positive self-esteem. It also helps children to appreciate and value differences in those around them. Children who experience inclusive environments are more likely to be accepting of others and sensitive to others' needs. Inclusive services provide rich and positive experiences for young children, and these experiences will stay with them for life. So what is inclusion? Inclusion is defined as the act of making a person or thing part of a group or collection. It's not exclusion, it's not segregation or integration. And according to the Diversity Council of Australia, there are three elements to inclusion. It occurs when a group of diverse people feel valued and respected, have access to opportunities and resources, 
and contribute their experiences, skills and perspectives to their environment. An inclusive service is a reflective service that embraces, embeds and includes diversity in its everyday practice. The experience of every child lies at the centre of inclusive practice. Their experiences will be influenced by their identity, the culture and practices of their family, community they live in, the social, economic, cultural setting of their society. Their experience will also be informed by early learning professionals they come, they come into contact with, the service providers whose settings they use. These in turn are affected by the educational and research institutions that develop the workforce and inform and disseminate professional practice. Government policies, regulations and guidelines influence the nature and accessibility of services too. Sometimes experiences and environments can be labelled or viewed as being inclusive, particularly when a child or family or educator has access to the environment. But this access can be limited to being an observer. Inclusion only truly exists when individuals are involved in meaningful ways, where they are valued, where they are seen and heard, respected, with access to opportunities and resources so they can be active contributors to their experiences. Welcoming all children, families and educators and appreciating and embracing diversity in our services enables families and staff to work well together, which all a positive impact on both adults and children's mental health and well-being. So, Tokenism, tokenism, what is tokenism? It is a symbolic action. It is an experience or practice that may appear to promote diversity and be inclusive when in reality, the effect, intention or lack of behind it is quite different. The prevalence of tokenism regarding diversity, inclusion and inclusive practices and steps we take to avoid it need to be considered regularly. Tokenism is a practice or policy of making no more than a symbolic effort or gesture, as in offering opportunities to minorities equal to those the majority already have. A comment was made by Kate from SNAKE, Secretariat of National Aboriginal and Islander Child Care, about her feelings around inclusion in an early learning environment. And she said, and once I'm inside in the early learning service, service it's very real in better practice, so it's not tokenistic. Not just a table with Aboriginal stuff on it. I want to see how I can relate to things I do at home within your centre. This comment was in reference to Kate's cultural heritage, but would also be applied to many of the diverse situations we mentioned earlier in this webinar. Tokenism can be a starting point if you don't know what to do. It needs to engage critical thinking and reflective practice and multiple perspectives, curiosity. Your view of tokenism can change as your understanding grows. Moving beyond tokenism is done through intentionality, authenticity and a genuine commitment to continuous learning, action, reflection and improvement. It is also important to recognise that both the experience of and goals for embracing, embedding and including diversity are forever. Remember this first involves considering our own personal views and judgments, our beliefs and values before we even begin to act. And decisions about inclusive practices can be, can be made keeping in mind that the goal is that everyone feels included, welcome and that our behaviour reflects this. We have individual and professional responsibilities for directly promoting diversity and inclusive practice. That everyone needs a chance to know each other and feel connected to members of the learning community and learning space. And what we do to be inclusive and promote diversity needs to evolve as our understandings grow and the context of our community changes. Doing what we always do, how we always do it without reflection, leaves us studying a fine line between inclusive and tokenistic practices. The 
let's have a look at the next slide. Today is about looking at what we currently um, do as individuals and early learning communities to embed, embrace and include diversity in many ways. We will consider the degree to which we do these things and then look forward at, at what's next in terms of our continuous improvement and learning as individuals and organisations. When we embrace diversity, we acknowledge, understand and respond in ways that value, respect, prioritise and promote other ways of being, doing and knowing. It requires us to not to feel threatened or ashamed. When we embed diversity, our practices that acknowledge, understand and respect, we prioritise and promote diversity as the norm, not the exception in our daily lives. Almost to the point that our intentional actions, if we're not engaged in cycle of continuous reflection and improvement, would lose their visibility. So picture a place where diversity is embraced, embedded and included in daily practice, as well as strategic planning for quality improvement. What would you observe? So just thinking about the previous Venn diagram, the triangle um, is the area that represents an overlap of, or balance between embedding, embracing and including ways to promote diversity. In reality, do we want to achieve a perfect balance? Is it even possible? Who decides on that perfect balance? And if it was the case, where to from there. So there really is no final or all-encompassing answer. Your practices will be influenced by time, place, people, philosophies, your own mental health and well-being, emotional state. Um, it's all about staying curious and open to taking risks. So let's put up a poll. What does everyone what does everyone in the audience think? Is, is embrace and bed included and include considered equality equally in your place? Tell us which are achievable to apply in your practice and which ones might be more challenging. So I'm seeing here that um, a lot of people are saying that embracing is achievable um, and that all of them are achievable. So embedding looks a little more challenging than mine. Um, and including is also achievable. Considering and reflecting about our thoughts and ways of embracing, embedding and including diversity can be done within the context of what we do to acknowledge, understand and respond in ways to promote and value diversity. Today we are going to consider how our ways to acknowledge, understand and respond as, the, as discrete concepts. However, in practice they are not isolated or undertaken in a linear fashion. They are in constant interplay and work in unison. So what does it mean to um, when we acknowledge diversity? And when I hear this question, Marie, I think about power and power imbalance. Um, very often, um, I feel we really need to be mindful about our power imbalance that potentially is there. Because power ultimately is relational and it's socially constructed. Uh, and also power is the capacity to bring about change. So it can really be used productively. Uh, we can influence people by our actions, ways of being and ways of doing. We can focus on needs, uh, individual and community needs, and we can certainly affect um, our environment. And so how have you witnessed diversity in an early learning service? How have you witnessed that diversity in the early learning service has been acknowledged? 
And that's something that can happen in little bits um, or it can be overlapping and over, uh, all encompassing. Um, it's about considering uh, where where are those change points? Where have we decided that everything is, a, is that diversity has been acknowledged? Have we explored a growth mindset? Um, how how people are feeling? How the people are feeling in the service? So, what do you do now that acknowledges diversity at your place? So what are the big things you do that acknowledge diversity? Focusing on the ordinary, daily, small practices that make a big difference. Inclusion empowers people to contribute their experiences and their perspectives. Partnerships with educators and families will empower them through embracing ideas and plans, a reflecting of diversity that exists within their unique learning community and embedding these in practice. It's important to regularly review our services philosophy, our processes, our practices, and also pedag pedagogical approaches to ensure they truly align with the diversity represented within your service. Doing this shows that the service and educators respect and value their, their learning community and the responses to them. So in the chat, we've got um, that um, Sharon mentioned acknowledgement. Um, and Christine has said the use of first languages and greetings and throughout the day, amazing. Um, Lynette, reflect, in, reflect through the environment. That's great, Lynette. Um, acknowledging um, acknowledgement through song. Diversity and inclusion embedded from policies, edu uh, policies, educational program, interactions and relationships from Trudy. Ensuring that we get to um, know the family. Um, Amelia has taken interest and inquire about the lives of children and families in the outside world. Um, conversations with families about home, life, background and culture. Thank you, Rhiannon. So there are a variety of ways for everybody um, to engage and explore um, diversity. So everyone in the voice should have, everyone should have a voice in learning communities. So this is vital for the individual and collective well-being and in providing an inclusive community. So consider your communication with family. Be, inclu be, inclusive, be inclusive and use respectful appropriate language that does, that does not exclude anyone. Be aware of educational and literacy levels and, that means, and what means of communication best suits your learning community. A link will be provided for one of our um, BU modules include, and it elaborates in more detail about using those policies and procedures um, in an intentional way to acknowledge diversity. So your learning community can develop policies and procedures that outline clear expectations of inclusive practices and legislative requirements. Take advantage of cultural competency training and other forms of professional development. These can support you to understand the experience of others who might not, you might not know well, and to better understand the challenges some members of your local community might be facing. So what is cultural competence? Cultural competence begins from the understanding that we are all influenced by the different social, emotional, and organizational cultures around us. When we recognize that our beliefs and values aren't the only ways of seeing and doing and being, we are open up to learning about other perspectives. We understand and relate to others better and build a sense of belonging among children and families when we explore similarities and differences in our cultural expectations. As, as mentioned with some people through the post about reviewing curriculum and programs, you and your learning community can review curriculum materials, including books and resources to ensure they include positive attributes about inclusion and diversity. This includes being alert to how learning materials can impact the, well, um, the engagement of children and young people from diverse backgrounds. What will I think about 
next to grow the ways we acknowledge diversity and our practices? Do we need to start with me or are we ready to look at the collective? Tell us in the chat. I can see um, Lynette's um, comment, thank you Lynette, that everyone should be able to see and hear themselves and a genuine curiosity um, to understand the other person and a different way of viewing the world and experiencing it. So let's think about understanding. What does it mean when we understand diversity? And when I think about understanding diversity, I think about sharing values and skills. I think about um, effective, meaningful communication. And I think about creativity and un unleashing creativity and divergent thinking. But also I think about cultivating diversity within me, not just around me. And I think this is a really important point to appreciate and connect with oneself um, that we touched on earlier today. I also like to mention um, just quickly uh, that when we think about diversity and how we understand it, um, we might include and con con um, consult a number of different frameworks on a local, state or federal level. Um, we might think about the NQS and, and how um, our actions and our goals can re be reflected in our quality improvement plan. So have you witnessed an early learning service um, understanding diversity? And I guess when you see diversity and practice and see how it's translated into, into practice, theory from theory to practice, it's always contextual. It's always depending on the circumstance, depending on the community, depending on the priorities and needs of that particular community. Um, our always EU action charts are, are very helpful uh, resources to uh, further develop this understanding. Um, there are many ways of knowing, being, and doing. For example, uh, within the mentally healthy community domain, um, the strong connectedness, or within the early learning resilience domain, uh, thinking about supporting identity um, growth. Um, also have a look at the Always See You ebook, The Learning on Country, What Do You Know? Uh, which is a wonderful guide and provocation to deepen our understanding of what diversity is. So let's have a look at the next slide, growing our ways to understand. Have you ever asked someone to do something and had someone to do it in a way you hadn't anticipated? Asking, communicating and observing are important in growing our understanding of the world around us, of others. Remember, there are many ways we can gather and share information to grow our understanding and many ways to learn. When this is done with warmth, with kindness, with respect, empathy, and genuineness, relationships of trust, mutual respect also develop. A word about seeking to understand in the moment. Being a mindful educator is to be present and be aware of what is happening in each of the moments throughout the time we work with children. Becoming aware of the way we as educators Focus and tune in to what is happening within the program, enabling and connecting with the present moment. This wonderful quote by Shane Hinton. Being aware of every child and tuning into them will promote children's sense of self and grow understanding of the diversity in our place, in our places. And ultimately, the best learning happens when children and adults um, see. Um, the community around them value diversity, modeling this in everyday practice and communicating both intention and understanding. Helping all children to understand difference encourages them to feel good about who they are. It also helps children to understand where they fit in in the world and to appreciate diversity in others. We know that when the environment is safe, supportive and inclusive for everyone, then diversity and everyone's identity is acknowledged and respected. 
Today's webinar is just an introduction to acknowledging, understanding and responding to diversity. And I encourage you to, do, to reflect on where you will go next to increase your understanding of diversity. <clears throat> As educators striving to embrace, embed and include diversity of practices that promote, prioritise, value and respect diversity, we need to begin by asking ourselves, can everyone participate and contribute in this experience or environment? If the answer is yes, then go ahead. If the answer is no, then maybe there may be some strategies that you can consider implementing after reflecting on what the barriers might, that need to be addressed. So what are the tips and strategies you do for supporting and maximising children's men, um, meaningful participation? Or what does it mean when we respond in ways that promote, prioritise, value and respect diversity? So let's do a poll. Think about what you do now that demonstrates how you respond for diversity. How effective do you consider your practices? Somewhat effective, but this is a priority is um, quite significantly being responded to compared to the other option. Um, and that, that's a really, I think a really positive reflection on, the educa on educators and their reflection of self and practice um, to be thinking about that. So um, behind we've got very effective and with continuous improvement, which is also an important um, process in approaching our practice. So before considering what we need to think about next to grow the way we respond to diversity, we're going to explore how our understanding of agency, rights and environment can influence how we respond. There is further opportunity to explore agency rights and empowering environment in the BU module Empower and that link will be available to you via the chat. So we need to ensure that children develop their own sense of identity and the opportunity to have a voice. It is important to recognise that social and emotional education is everybody's responsibility and that everyday interactions adults have with children foster these skills. Educators who reflect, plan, embed and model social and emotional skills and behaviour into everyday practices are strengthening children's agency and developing an understanding of and acknowledgement of diversity. How we, respond, how we respond can support children's developing sense of agency, how they feel good about themselves and consequently be more confident in trying and learning new things. Agency develops when children are supported to actively participate in experiences and decisions that shape their lives and those of their families and other children. It is a child-led and dependent on developmental stage and will look different in every setting. Agency is strengthened when you listen respectfully, value and consider children's opinions, respond to their needs and support them when needed. So how are you supporting children's agency? Tell us in the chat. Experiences and environments like this support the development of resilience, independence and positive social and emotional learning and they are protective factors for mental health and well-being. This is because uh, they support children to feel um, that they belong, that they have a sense of connectedness and enjoy respectful relationships with educators. It makes them that they are visible, that they have a voice and have plentiful opportunities to be competent and capable contributors to their world. This also involves having opportunities to learn about and use their rights. We mentioned the Convention on the Rights of the Child earlier today. So this is a revised treaty consisting of fundamental principles that support and guide early learning professionals to plan and develop empowering learning environments and programs. When these principles are considered embedded into daily practice, we can truly grow a sense of resilience. 
um, independent and social emotional skills. When we focus on supporting children's agency, we acknowledge that they have rights and they can actively contribute to decisions in the service and in their, in their learning. Protecting children's rights is empowering and fundamental to their well-being and resilience. We need to reflect on with children and learn with children that whatever we say matters and that all people, all children and adults can have a voice and need to be seen. We can also show children they are valued um, and we need to show them they're worthy of respect and they have rights. We can see children as individuals, value their experiences, their special perspectives um, and focus on their potential. We can focus on resilience and strength and definitely support all children, regardless of ability, location, status, background, culture, gender identity, in becoming active participants in their learning and in their lives. We need to respect children and see them as competent and capable with their own interests, independent thoughts, ideas, feelings, curiosities, and require opportunities to express these and be listened to. Mental health and well-being is most likely to flourish in a supportive and inclusive environment, a safe place where diversity and our right to be ourselves is acknowledged, respected and seen as adding to the vibrancy and strength of the entire community. Just having a look at the chat here, uh, based on the question about how we support children's agency, and there's been some quite a detailed um, information coming through demonstrating uh, everybody's work to support children's agency. Uh, Sally says, we see each child and value what they bring to the group. We hear their voice. We respect each child for who they are. Um, Trudy has said that uh, children are given lots of choices to be involved in decisions concerning all that affects them throughout, throughout the day. That's, very, that's a very empowering position to put ch that children can be in. So continuing on with uh, thinking about our, the environment, so acknowledging and embedding the diversity of your service in everyday practice creates an environment uh, where children can express their voice, be visible and enact their rights and self-determination. And that's become evident through some of those um, responses in the chat as well. We need to consider our roles as educators in this space carefully because our attitudes influences, influence children's developing sense of self as they tend to think of themselves in the ways that significant adults in their lives will um, relate to and talk to them, talk about them. The children are building a picture of who they are uh, by the way that the adults interact with them, by what is being mirrored back to them, and by the relationship that is built um, through the daily interactions with their environment, their adult, the adults and the, and the peers. Our philosophical and pedagogical approaches can impact directly on the experiences children have within these learning environments. Uh, so again, it's important to reflect, reflect on our, our own personal approaches and those that um, are service-based or um, um, from research and evidence. Uh, consider how your early learning service or school's philosophy might reflect those policies, beliefs and understandings related to children's rights and how children learn and develop capacity for self-determination and agency. So environments that pro, um, promote resilience um, they, um, through diversity is because there are opportunities for the children to direct their own learning, um, develop confidence in their abilities, generate and explore new ideas, interact with others and experiment um, with risky play, have a go without fear of failure. Um, ask for support when they need it, and to participate in decision making, which I um, see through the chat is a common theme. So how educators work with children can also influence children's beliefs about their own abilities. So that's where we need to think about our intentional teaching and um, supporting that learning through play, where children are encouraged to explore and take risks um, that will assist them in developing that independence and competence. Remembering um, 
also the hidden learning or hidden curriculum in any environment is essential too. So that hidden learning occurs through planned and incidental experiences as children observe and experience. So that incidental learning can come from observing the body language of others, um, how, how adults respond to what they say and what they do, what is said, what is not said, uh, what is left out, what is hi um, highlighted or prioritised, how people are portrayed in books, for example, messages about gender and inclusion, uh, and also the way um, spaces and experiences, um, for example, the individual versus group experiences are set up and the amount of time spent in each space. So every interaction and experience, even when a child isn't directly involved, can impact on how they see themselves, their identity and their abilities. Relationships are integral to this, um, and that is modelling, practising and growing those authentic relationships. can move on to the next slide. Thank you, Karen, for your lovely um, message in the chat, believe in, believe in them. And I think when I think about um, a really optimal and best learning environment for young children, it is definitely um, that sense of responsiveness, uh, being respectful, sensitive, um, understanding a different um, way of experiencing uh, the program. When you think about the children's sense of agency and how it develops, um, they really grow as individuals um, when, they are know, when they know that they are valued, when they are seen and heard. And someone mentioned that in the chat box as well. Thank you for that. So I'd I invite you to take time to really look and listen and feel uh, and physically experience the environment and the moment from a child's perspective. Are your relationships positive and responsive? Um, is the social and emotional learning embedded in everyday practice? Is resilience supported within the curriculum? When we think about routine experiences, for example, nappy change times, are we using them uh, to connect with children, to really use, to use to build a relationship? And are routine practices reflective of children's voice and their identity or something else? I would like to show you uh, always be you wise words. And they say, it's about shared respect. It's about shared meaning, shared knowledge and experience of learning, living and working together with dignity and truly listening. It's about shared respect, shared meaning, shared knowledge and experience of learning, living and working together with dignity and truly listening. So really it comes down to um, respect, to compassion, and to connection. Connection to self and connection to others. So what will you think about next to acknowledge diversity? What will you think about next to really grow the ways you understand and deepen your understanding about diversity? And how will you deepen your practices in responding to promoting, prioritizing, valuing, and respecting diversity? So thank you for joining us today. As many of you know, these webinars are a great tool to not only learn, reflect, and put together, um, put in learning into action, they also assist in demonstrating our individual commitment to continued professional develop, development with BU. But have you heard they can also support documentation and guide whole service of school professional learning and continuous improvement? Um, you can contact our team today and we can assist you. For anyone already um, participate, uh, that's part of a participating service or school, um, simply contact your BU consultant. If your service or school isn't, a reg isn't registered as a participating service as yet, and you'd like to know more about what is involved, check out um, how to start this experience and join us today. See the link um, in the chat um, about how you can get started. 
So you can join a check-in event and talk about what you've learned and done soon. Just remember though, check-ins aren't check-ups. Most importantly, they are not check-ups. So they're often constant um, consultants spotting that great learning and action that uh, is being done. And sometimes this is action and learning that the educators that are having their check-in with the consultants isn't noticing themselves. It's often easier, you know, for a pair of outside eyes and ears to notice. So um, please remember to complete the exit survey that will be put up soon and please include the names um, followed by um, separate email addresses of anyone what, who is watching with you. Um, it is really important to include the names and email addresses um, so that they, everybody can get a certificate. Um, so they, each of those need to be an individual email address. So thank you for your time today um, and please, please complete uh, this form so that we can um, get your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your active participation, for your insightful comments and questions. It sounds like it's a, it's a wonderful uh, conversation in the chat.